is such a wonderful pleasure, a privilege, an opportunity for us to have these two extraordinary guests here visiting our class today, education policy and planning policy analysis, critical policy analysis, uh, all of the above class. Um, and uh, y'all have been an amazing group of students to have had this year. And to me, this is a treat, these uh, outstanding leaders with us to talk about their leadership, but also their perspectives on uh, uh, what it means to come together, as you can see, uh, as a community through black-brown dialogues on policy. Why is it important that we come together as black and brown humanity? Um, and also, what are we wanting to accomplish in the immediate uh, sense of the diversity, equity, and inclusion bills in the Texas State Legislature? So first, I wanted to introduce to you to my partner in crime, my husband, Dr. Emilio Zamora, who's a professor in the history department. And I just learned today that he's the winner of a Lifetime Achievement Award for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So congratulations, Dr. Zamora. And that was from the uh, Division of uh, Diversity and Community Engagement, mm -hmm. yeah, which is the largest division, as it turns out. He is uh, also someone who has been actively involved in policy debates with um, the State Board of Education and advancing Mexican-American studies and ethnic studies and also working to, uh, at the level of the legislature to, um, to bring law uh, to bear on what we hope will be ethnic studies policy in the state of Texas this session with House Bill 45. Um, he can share more about himself if he wants, but you know I want to get the conversation going. And so, uh, President Gary Bledsoe of the NAACP, attorney extraordinaire, uh, legendary leader in the state of Texas, who has been advocated uh, advocating for a long, long time now for the rights of uh, African Americans and Mexican Americans and 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 you know people like ourselves that um, that uh, represent. Um, a, a broad spectrum of humanity, right, of people who are not faring well under the current um, state system, that it's also legal. It's also the legal system, and he's been involved in a lot of, of legal fights in Texas. And last February, it was a low point, and so uh, the students were pretty depressed, I would say, about the state of things. Uh, what we had thought would be a racial reckoning became a backlash, right, in the state of Texas. And so it was a very uh, sad moment last February, a year ago. And um, and it, it occurred to me, I said, well, maybe I can bring Gary Bledsoe to come and talk to the students, uh, virtually, of course. And so I called him up, and I remember that evening we had a conversation, and I shared with him what was happening in the class. and. Um, that the students were very depressed and, um, and that um, you know, I was concerned with what was going on at South Lake and, and Eanes and the Eanes Independent School District. I heard the South Lake podcast and he shared that uh, the, um, the NAACP had gotten involved in litigation in South Lake and that, um, uh, that uh, the, you know, the situation was severe and that there was, and I knew that it was. And, um, you know, so in that space of like being very concerned about what's happening in the schools and with our youth and the kind of bigotry that is happening that's free flowing with just, you know, without any real um, concern for, um, for how they are behaving in, in our schools, many of them um, in South Lake and also in Eanes, I said, what do we do, Gary? And he said, well, how about if we have black brown dialogues on policy? And so I wrote that down, and uh, he did come and speak to my class, which was, which was helpful, I think. <laughs> I hope it was still a downtime, but it was helpful. And I think more than anything, it brought us together. Gary and I had worked together for about, about 10 years in the Texas State Legislature, at least. Um, first, me as uh, the Education Committee Chair for uh, Texas LULAC and, and him with the NAACP. And, uh, and, and we've always worked uh, together as NAACP and LULAC, and we just continued, uh, even after I, I, I was no longer the uh, education committee chair for Texas LULAC. And so, it, you know, this, this very difficult moment happily brought us together. The next morning I met with Colette Phillips. Colette Phillips uh, 
is a major diversity leader in Boston. She's coming between Boston and Austin uh, for her own personal reasons. And that really is what started the conversation on black brown dialogues, on policy, which is that we all have to unite and come together with black and brown being a big intersectional tent, inclusive of white allies, intersectional, Gen Z inclusive. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's a vision for how we move forward. So without further ado, <coughs> Maybe, Gary, you can comment first on what we're trying to accomplish. I want to say Dr. Valerie Umbrella has, you guys probably know her mainly from this space, but she has been an incredible force at the, at the legislature, been a great ally. We fought all kinds of battles trying to get Mexican-American history curriculum for the high schools, to get African-American history curriculum for the high schools, fighting to preserve the top 10 percent program, which has continued to be under attack. Many fights that we fought in. Uh, I run, we've won a lot of them, actually, which is surprising. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that'll continue in the future with right. the way things are, are going, but we have to be optimistic like Emilio. I see what's occurring in Texas as really an all-out assault uh, against um, uh, racial and ethnic minorities or anyone that doesn't share a right-wing point of view. And I'm very serious um, about that. And I think because of those uh, attacks and people being under refuge, uh, we need to understand that uh, working together, we will protect our communities a lot more effectively than if we're all uh, divided. So um, it's kind of like if you saw the old movie Glory Road when one of the players in Texas Westerns first African-American, uh, the first all-black team to win an NCAA basketball championship. One gets beaten up, and then the leader of the team, the point guard, says that uh, from, from now on, we go together uh, in, in threes, and there's not, uh, they won't pick us off one by one like that anymore, or what have you. It's the same kind of idea here. You know, what's occurred in Texas, and the reason why BBDP is so important, but BBDP uh, has the vision, uh, once we get this uh, it's solidified with, with black and brown, that obviously we support all the other communities as well, because I think the people that are forming BBDP uh, have a holistic uh, attitude uh, about um, individuals. But, but the thing about that we have to understand is that uh, in Texas, the 2010 census uh, put the um, black and brown, the percentage of the adult population that was black and brown at 49.4. And now it's, it's greater than 50%. This whole idea about the uh, replacement theory or what have you that you hear being discussed on a national level, well, that's, that's come to fruition in Texas right now, according to the latest census. Uh, uh, Texas is now 41% white. And so it's really 60-40. And so uh, what I've come up is with this phrase, this idea, that what Texas is about is making 40 greater than 60. And so the idea is to be able to uh, manipulate the 40%. And so that if you set it up to where uh, with, with, with frightening Latino citizens from registering to vote, uh, turning out to vote, coming up with all kinds of reasons to disqualify black vote, for example. You change the nature of the electorate. And so all those things are part and parcel of this effort, looking at the numbers and how you change the nature of the electorate so that you have a dominant group of voters that vote your way each and every time. And so that's kind of a manifestation of the Southern strategy. And honestly, there have been a few uh, disagreements here and there between black and brown, and I think those things are not uh, really uh, to be uh, avoided but discussed because I think that you can uh, do a lot together. And we thought, well, we don't really need to be doing that and be fighting over a small piece of pie when we both deserve more than that little piece we're fighting over. So why don't we get together and, 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 and fight for the, for the uh, legitimate piece that each one of us owns? So that's what we're trying to do with BBDP, and uh, uh, Dr. Valenzuela has one brilliant idea, which may be one of the, will be one of the first ideas I hope we implement. Be effective, 
I've learned, uh, learned early on that I needed to speak out, but speak out with others for change. You can't do it by yourself. You're a fool if you think you can do it by yourself. You'll fail. You need to have a network. You need to have a base, whatever you want to call it. And I was attracted, attracted uh, by the idea of uh, forming a group of uh, trustworthy individuals because I truly believe that uh, before anything else, uh, your political relationships, your relationships in the area of policy or whatever, I call them political relationships, have to be based on a, a personal relationships that you work. And the women feminists of the 70s had it right. The personal is political. It always has to be. You cannot build anything unless you build things around personal relationships. The most important thing that you have to develop in those personal relationships in the process of uh, participating and creating change with others is you have to build trust. You have to build trust. Otherwise, uh, you cannot sustain an organization with, with such demands that are placed on, on them, particularly the organizations that lead in the area of change, uh, particularly with regards to marginalized groups. Uh, I remember once when we <clears throat> had about <laughs> with the State Board of Education members, 15 of them elected, most of them conservative, and bless their heart, you know, they did the work to get themselves elected. They have every right to be there. But anyway, some of the young people were real dejected that if we had not really won the arguments that day. And so we congregated in, in, uh, in the hall, and some of the young people they need to be nurtured. As you get older, you realize that you have that responsibility over the young members in your network. You need to bring them along. And I remember that, that they were very de dejected. You see it in their faces. And one of them said, you know, God, we lost. And I said, no, we did not lose. If our primary objective is to build trust, to build those relationships that will carry us far, then we did. We, that's exactly what we did. We won the day. We reinforce the, the personal relationships on the basis of trust. How do you do that? You need to understand each other. You need to know each other. One of the most important lessons, I think, that come from world religions is that you need to acknowledge the worth of others and then act accordingly. And that's basically, that's basically the, the lesson in, uh, that I, I shared with the young people. And I think it helped. It encouraged them. Um, I think you always need to be uh, positive in that way <clears throat> and encourage your young people by reminding them that when you come together for a good purpose, you're building trust. And that's the element that will take you far. And I, I saw that in this organization, um, that we were going to meet together and everybody was very friendly and open. And, and I, I like the idea of getting to know folks. I got to know Gary a little bit better. Uh, I already trusted him, but I think that trust got strengthened. And as a consequence, I think, I think we'll always win. I, and you have to think in those terms, because this business is, uh, it can bring you down. This business of uh, confronting powerful forces and, and being unable to, to convince them to do otherwise, like the uh, authors and sponsors of these horrible bills, these people are really mean-spirited. <laughs> uh, it's not just a question of ideas. It's attitude and mean-spiritedness. Um, I don't think they necessarily are interested in, in negotiating with us. Oh, the, my... And one other thing, I'm a historian, so one of the things we've talked about that I could bring to the table is uh, information on instances in which Mexicans and African Americans and whites, we can never forget the rest of the folks. <laughs> we always have to include the rest of the folks. Um, and so one of the things that I've learned in history is, the, is that there's been many instances in which people have come together despite differences and they've found common ground and they've moved together, built trust and built important social movements. Um, let, me, let me just share with you uh, a story. Uh, Ruth Allen, a labor economist, I'll get to the point, I'll go back to the point in a minute, but let me start with the story. Ruth Allen, a labor economist from UT Austin, 
who I interviewed was a fine, fine person, a uh, sweet lady, but she was also racist. <laughs> she didn't mean to be racist, but she was. And she wrote an article or a book within, within which she said, basically, um, we made a mistake when we brought uh, African people and made them slaves in this country. That was a horrible mistake we made. And it's a mistake because now their great, great children are talking about reparations, about correcting the problem, the rising up and speaking as African Americans. We didn't learn that lesson. Um, now we're committing another similar error. We're letting many Mexicans come in. They're going to start, their children are going to start making the same claims in American society, justified claims. We are in a major dilemma. Now, I ask myself, I mean, that's important enough that somebody of that stature should say that and basically reflect the feelings and ideas that other people carried. This is not just her ideas. I could give you other instances, other examples in which this uh, horrible reaction appeared. One other, in 1912, uh, State Federation of Labor in Texas got together in San Antonio, of all places, Mexican, a predominantly Mexican community. And the delegation from El Paso, another Mexican, predominantly Mexican town, submitted a delegation and was unanimously approved. And it basically was an interpretation of Texas history. And they said, up until we got here, there was this cosmic junk with tarantulas and, and a species, a subhuman species called a greaser. That was our interpretation of Texas history. But why, the, the important question is why? Why were they saying that in 1912 and 1936? They were reacting. They were reacting against um, organized efforts to create change by Mexicans and African Americans separately, independent of each, and together. That's my argument. And I, I could make a good case. And that's what I want to contribute to the Black Brown Dialogue, to bring that information. I don't know what we can do with it. Podcasts, perhaps, maybe a textbook uh, or, or, or something quicker. But I think we need to uh, uh, not only model behavior, but we also need to talk about other people that have modeled behavior, particularly for the young. I'm, we're really interested in, in working with children and developing curriculum that speaks among other things, so these instances in history where African Americans and Mexican Americans and whites got together. One great example, this is what I think, this is what I think the TSFL, Texas Federation of Labor, and Ruth Allen were reacting against. In 1909, 1910, one of the most important labor federations in the history of Texas emerged in Central and North Texas. It was called the Land, the land Rent, the Renters of America, later was called the Land League of America. Uh, I don't know, we don't know exactly how many members there were, but there could have been at least 10, 15,000 cotton pickers and land renters. Poor whites, poor African Americans, and poor Mexican Americans. Uh, and they built a labor federation. That's not to say that there were angels. <laughs> uh, we all carry those horrible seeds of uh, animosity that are planted in us by society. But they obviously worked against that, and they built something. And I think it's a great example to give to the youth and others, to give them hope that we can build uh, unity around issues that speak to shared experiences, despite the fact that we have some problems between us. That's not to deny that. But uh, there are sufficient examples to model the, uh, that, that model behavior and that we need to, to do that. And that's what I want to do. And as a class, we've uh, looked at a number of instances of uh, black and brown kind of cooperation. Um, I, I really like what you said about trust because it reminds me of um, of Derek Bell in Silent Covenants. I don't know if y'all read it, but it's a great book. And, um, and he was a civil rights attorney, and later he went on to uh, found critical race theory. 
Um, and one of the things that he said as he reflected on his work as a civil rights attorney in the South, I mean, going from community to community, was that it was triumphant just to, just to resist, right? Just, just to respond to racism and to white supremacy. That was triumphant. And I think that he's capturing the, the kind of community building that we've been learning about and how, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we don't, you know, in, in our lifetimes get to where we would like to get to, but the very process of it is just as important as what we're pursuing, right, as the goal. And so I think there is victory to be, to be experienced in the struggle, even if not everything pans out the way that we, the way that we want it to when we want it to. And now we find ourselves, it's interesting, as Black Brown Dialogues, we, we kind of had this beginning of, uh, well, what do we do? And we have the, the BBDP Next Gen group that's formed. Uh, and maybe y'all can talk about it in a little bit. Uh, Jules and Daniela, y'all been very um, um, you know, important to Leah, and I think, I think you've been part of those, some of those conversations. Maybe others in the class, I'm not sure. They don't tell me <laughs> what they're up to. But, um, but, <clears throat> but then the session hit, right? And then the session hit, and that kind of arranged, arranged things for us. Uh, and, and, and I think that that's really interesting, by the way, just as an idea, that you know, here we are trying to create, we're trying to build, and then there's all these weapons of mass distraction. And uh, in today's press conference, that was one of the things that Representative Ron Reynolds mentioned. And it was a press conference, maybe you attended it, on uh, DEI and the attack on our universities and our faculty and our students, our curriculum that's, that's happening right now. Uh, through these bills in Texas, Senate Bill 16, Senate Bill 17, and 18, and then their House Companion Bills, right? Um, and instead of having a conversation that we should be having on the environment, the climate change, gun safety, right? I mean, you can just go down the list. We're having these other conversations about a, uh, a solution, ostensibly, for a problem that isn't there, right? If anything, DEI, the evidence is overwhelming that uh, it's positive for uh, you know, being innovative, inventive, creative. You know, diverse teams are more powerful than teams that are not diverse in the world of work or uh, in the academy. So, so we've pivoted. I think it's been helpful. Uh, and I know, Gary, we, we've been talking about strategy. Um, what thoughts do you have going forward? I mean, we did something good today with the press conference. Um, a lot more needs to happen. Uh, what are your thoughts about where we're headed with DEI in the legislature right now? Well, I think one of the things we should know is, is we're not out of the woods. Um, I'm, I'm with Emilio. I'm going to be optimistic. Uh, but we're not out of the woods. Uh, what we have to understand is that you never underestimate your opposition. And uh, Dan Patrick is a master. And what he's done with the Senate, I have never seen. Uh, he has complete and total control over the state Senate. And um, this last time, we were able to beat them on several bills with allies over on the House side who were not that extreme. And towards the end of the last special session, he came up with uh, understanding that, well, I'll just hold up your bills over here that any of you have, any of you that's voting against my bills on the, on the House side, uh, I'm going to kill anything you have on the Senate side. So um, we, we look at things like that and you understand that people have real power. And this time, they just hit us with another one. We were out there and Dr. Valenzuela had identified all the DEI bills and so she was already uh, helping to form alliances and then we uh, get a call one day, uh, about 7 o'clock at night, I was on the elliptical machine working out, and get this call that the next morning they're going to have Rider 186 to be heard. And the reps didn't know until that evening themselves, about 5 o'clock or so. And they love to pull shenanigans. They did it during the special session where they give you almost no notice of an upcoming hearing. The Senate has cut public testimony now down to two minutes. And during the pandemic, they were requiring you to show up in person 
uh, and not be able to give a virtual testimony. So they'll, they'll pull anything out of the hat they can to, to make them win. And so the idea of the timing uh, is, is one issue. So we need to understand that we don't know what else that the lieutenant governor has in store. And I say the lieutenant governor because no disrespect to the governor, but I think the master is the lieutenant governor. I mean, I'm just going to be straight up about it. That's, that's, who the, that's who the master is, is the lieutenant governor. And um, so uh, what we need to do is emphasize the House of Representatives. And so we need to be able to come up with a strategy for trying to reach 76 votes over there. And that's what we were working on today. And so we know if there are 88 Republican votes, you've got to at least uh, peel off 13 of those to have any chance of prevailing. That's a lot of Republican votes. Now, the Speaker is not on the wavelength with the Lieutenant Governor. The Speaker is someone you can talk with, but we realize that as powerful as the Speaker is, the Lieutenant Governor is more powerful. So, so the one thing that's missing from the quotient uh, is getting allies, uh, because you know Martin Luther King talked about that. We, we couldn't win this thing ourselves. It's going to take all good people coming together. And what's really missing right now is each one of the news conferences will have black folk and brown folk, but we need to have other folk and not just white Democrats. We need to have people that are conservatives, people that are religious, but maybe uh, see these issues of common decency the same way we do. We need to be able to work the House the best way we can because what I've, and, and let me give you this one example, uh, Doc Winter, when I go over this last session and, and I told many of our members this, it's different from other sessions when you go over and you engage a rep or a senator and you have six or seven people that work over there now. You go to the, it's almost like talking to a chair because they have no authority to modify or change or do anything different from what they're told to do. So they're like a, a two-year-old that's been told, you sit here and you wait till I tell you what to do. And so that makes it extremely difficult in terms of trying to identify what people have the character, the wherewithal, or whatever, to stand up for what's right and not worry about who's in leadership and what leadership will do to them. And that's easier said than done. You know, a few sessions ago, we got so many things done. And, Doc, we had so many victories over there, um, even with the Republican leadership. But that's when... We go sit down with uh, Republican reps and senators and the reasonable ones, we'd cut a deal and we'd come out and we'd win. We had so many criminal justice bills that we prevailed on. We had a great racial profiling bill that uh, we got adopted, a uh, hate crimes bill. I mean, things like that we were able to do with bipartisan support. Uh, but you just can't, uh, just, they just changed the landscape. They looked at that and the extremists have gotten control of their party, and uh, you are persona non grata if you stand up. So that's what we need to do, Doc. We need to come up with a strategy uh, to identify 13 votes on the Republican side in the House where we can win. Long-term strategy, uh, we need to do like the other side. I saw uh, the the fellow on Rachel Maddow the other day, and I already had this thought. I told my wife this. But we always think in terms of people, progressives think in terms of specific campaigns. Okay, and the right wingers think in terms of movements that, that, that take over power and control. And uh, we need to have a long term strategy. Uh, because, see, what they're doing now with critical race theory, with the invading the classroom, they understand that truth prevails and that our truth 
will win out in a debate or a discussion. So when you can't win the battle on truth, you have to pass a law requiring you to elevate untruth, and at the same time you're elevating untruth, you prevent the teaching of truth. And so it's pretty fascinating that that's really what they're doing. We actually have the law invading the classroom uh, to uplift them because the more and more public school uh, children understand the real history and uh, what all people have brought to this uh, country and to the world, uh, it would, um, uh, we could have a whole different world. And believe it or not, what we, we need to understand, we talk about Martin Luther King's, King's dream, Many people don't share that dream, and we think because it's great and we get out there on MOK's day, the day of the 55th anniversary of assassination, many people don't share that dream, and they're going to do everything that to, they can to make sure we don't get that dream, uh, that, we don't, that we never accomplish that. So we should never forget that. I, I, I am shocked where we are today because I'm one of those that was a kid in the 70s and and you guys age, and I was going to college and everything, and we were getting these victories, and the Supreme Court was saying, you can do this or that. We're opening things up. I never thought we were going to have to fight the same battles today that we fought back then. But evil didn't stop working, and this time they figured it out, just like the lieutenant governor, and they're trying to do it to where they're going to consolidate this whole power. And you guys were talking about January 6th earlier. That, that's the whole idea. The whole idea there it really is a revolution that's been going on in this country for quite some time. And I, I know I'm talking too long, but there are two things that I, I think I, I need to uh, mention is that one of my experts in redistricting is one of the preeminent political science scholars in, in the country, Dr. Richard Murray. And, and what he indicated was that after uh, 2008, uh, the most extreme conservatives in the, in the country and in the state, that the exit polls show this both for the state and the nation, that they show up at an 85 to 90 percent clip in every election. Every election. I'm not talking about just presidential election. Okay. So that now skews the numbers for even like your off your gubernatorial elections. And, and that skews the numbers for your local elections. Uh, and so what you found is when you had real reasonable uh, Republicans, people like Todd Smith and Jerry Matten, who, who saw the more increasing problems occurring within their party, they couldn't win uh, because of that whole, uh, of that, of that, of that whole dynamic. Uh, but there were two things that were, that, 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 that according to the uh, opinion polls, that spurred this group to get together and now to be such a force politically. Uh, fears about uh, the election of Barack Obama to the presidency and fears about what they perceived about uh, illegal um, immigration. Um, you know, one of the exhibits that we use in the litigation, uh, some of the exhibits in the redistricting litigation last time, was um, we um, um, was the, the overt racial overtone. They were taking white Democratic candidates and putting Mexican flags on them, putting uh, Chinese flags on them, uh, painting them darker in color uh, to where they look like they might be black, giving them a gold tee putting them in bed with President Obama. Um, they were, it, it was just really outright showing them, making ads with them as Cadillacs, with Cadillacs and, and talking about welfare queens. Mm -hmm. All this was in the last 10 years here in Texas um, with Chris and the Chris Turner campaign. They were all over with that. It's amazing that they did that. But now with AI and all that, who knows what you can do. But they were going straight for the... Uh, the jugular. And you know, in, in, in litigation now, the thing that wins for plaintiff's lawyers is a whole new philosophy that's erupted that comes ironically from Karl Rove. Um, but it's about, um, uh, you know, Democrats go for the head to appeal to reason. Republicans go for the gut because they think, they think and they know, and I think they're right. The gut dominates the head. 
And so if you get the gut, then the head will come. And so that's the reptilian instinct. And so we're trying to debate what research says. And they're talking about black people taking over your neighborhood. Latinos are taking over your neighborhood. You know, this kind of, and so they, they go for the gusto. And we're trying to say, well, data doesn't show this. No, that's not what's going to win elections. So we need to understand. We need to come up with reptilian thoughts of our own. <laughs> that's what we've been talking about, yeah, that re reptilian theory, right, that it's appealing to your basest instincts, which is what Steve Phillips writes about, is what has been the, the neo-Confederate strategy. It's pretty obvious. I mean, there's been numerous instances in history when this has happened. I mentioned the case of the, the 1930s and the 1920s, the reaction against uh, my immigration and the reaction against the marginalized groups that are organizing themselves. I, I think uh, at the moment, I think uh, what I see is like a frenzy, an eating frenzy, and a really uh, exaggerated abuse of power. And I think what these people are doing is that they're acting independent of each other. It's not a united movement by any means, I think. I think, I think they think the same. Consequently, many of them are able then to work up bills that look the same. But they're also being inconsistent, which provides political openings for folks that are well organized to then move forward. But uh, the bill by Longoria from South Texas, which in effect calls for the end to, to the 10% plan, is a mistake. Within their strategy of working together, it contradicts the other bills. The other bills, the, the anti DEI bills are arguing that we're using race and national origin and gender at, uh, in place of uh, merit. Here we have a case, a diversity initiative, which is a 10% plan, that is race neutral. That constitutes a really gross uh, hypocrisy. Uh, I, think, I think they're vulnerable there. How can you say one thing? You know, how can you say that race is not welcomed as a, as, as a variable in considering the creation of friendly, uh, fair uh, work and learning environments? And then at the same time, you, you do away with a, with a diversity program that doesn't use race. Um, that's a contradiction. I think it creates a political opening. Now, how do you make use of those political openings? Well, we can go and testify. We can, we can have the press conferences. All of that is very important, if for no other reason to create a record that we weren't uh, just rolling over. Uh, but I think that uh, there is this opportunity to come together in so many different ways. But one of the things that I wanted to say, the second thing, is that uh, there's a book that came out a couple of years ago. These political scientists did this book on Mexican-American voting behavior. And one of the things that they point out, which has been pointed out by so many people, that if you engage the public, the public will vote. One of our, the problems of our leadership is that they're not engaged as well as they should be with the general electorate, uh, Mexican, black, and white uh, folk. And, and I understand why. One of the reasons why we have this major assault is to keep people busy. And, and make them ineffective, it's, it's almost impossible to respond in an organized and effective manner against all of these bills when they're sh within a short period of time. That's part of the purpose. Yeah. I understand that. But I think that if, we, if the Democrats are going to win soon, they better start preparing uh, the way. <laughs> and one way, I think, is to have summits um, the caucuses, the minority caucuses, at one point were doing that. They would hold summit for the general public, where they would say, this is a record during this last session. This is what happened. This is how we intervene. These are the results. Now this is the agenda for the next time around. You know, you could have a major summit and then workshops in different districts led by the representatives to engage the public. If you engage the public, They'll register to vote, more importantly, they'll come out to vote. Um, and that's what these researchers found. <laughs> they did this analysis of people that vote, and they essentially voted because they were engaged. Somebody approached them and told them, your vote does matter. 
you know, I, I think uh, there are openings, but we, uh, I think the folks that call themselves leaders need to lead in engaging the electorate and getting them out to vote. Because ultimately, that's what's going to matter. Um, the, yeah. We increased, you know, we've been at it really for a short period of time, about 50 years. It's, it's really around the 70s when the representation of marginalized groups began to increase significantly. And then it took time to get prepared to, to, to build unity, the caucuses, and then to reach out and so forth. Uh, it's not easy to be involved in the community and, and translate concerns into policy uh, uh, initiatives. It's not easy to come at them because then you have to negotiate all this stuff with folks in this crazy, crazy circus. But I think, I think we have no choice but uh, to think in terms of electoral politics. There's many other strategies. A legal strategy is important, which may be necessary to undertake after the session is over. Uh, and that's why one of the reasons why the records are important, aside from other, thing, other reasons, historic reasons. But if there's a legal challenge against some of these bills, um, I'm an optimist because I, I, I want to train myself into being an optimist. But I'm, I, I have a pessimistic view of things, too. Uh, I think some of these bills are going to pass. I think, uh, I think uh, the gentleman was right to spoke today that they need to focus on that rider of the budget bill because all the other bills can fail, but th that may pass. And if that passes, then other things will happen. This is how this thing has been building up. This is not just happened the session. They were encouraged by some of the victories that they had during the last session. Now they're moving forward. And they're going to continue moving forward. There's all kinds of other things. Academic freedom is not really being attacked as much as it can, N not like DEI. So that's, that's around the corner. Um, area studies programs and, and the gender programs, I think, can be placed in jeopardy the next time around. Uh, and that's, that's a, that would be a huge loss. So. You know, I think the Democratic leadership better gets better start formulating some plans to increase the, the base and the number of votes to take over. Uh, I mean, it's come to that. It's a question of power. And we need to be realistic about that. And I think, I think, I think uh, well, one of the things that happens when these, when these kinds of assaults occur is that people get motivated. It's not, it's not just a question of going to the people and say, we appreciate your vote. We want your vote. You know, you can point to this. There's a lot at stake. We've invested a lot and change, and now they're put, turning us back. So, you know, that in combination with reaching out, I think, can, can change things around. That's what happened in the 70s. When women increased the representation of minorities, in the state legislature, in part because of the social movement and demographic factors, you know. Uh, but I think the social movement, which is something that is not really accorded importance uh, next to economic change and so forth, the social movements are very central to change. They reflect change and they reinforce change. We need to rebuild that movement of the 70s. And that, you know what's important? One of the other couple of other things, uh, language is important. <laughs> language, the language we use, it is an assault. That's an important term. There is hypocrisy. That's another important term. But also, how we behave is very important. We need to take the high road, too. We need to tell it, say it the way it is, but our comportment is important. You know what they say in church when you go out there, be sure you act right because it reflects on the, all the rest of us. We're doing that. I think we're, as, as the Reverend spoke, I don't know how many of you were at the press conference, but there was a, he's a bishop, isn't he? From Dallas? From Houston. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of power behind the pulpit, folks. You know, you gotta claim your authority, but you claim it with the right comportment. You know, you act right. 
You don't act like a fool. You don't do crazy things like the authors of these bills where they offend. They, um, they do so many horrible things with their language and their comportment. That's not what you, I mean, the, the best test is to say, would I do that in front of my children? Of course not. That, that's not the kind of stuff you, you do in front of children, where you speak badly about people, where you say, you know, that they're thinking racial terms, they're bigots, they're the cause of the high rise of suicide among our youth. <laughs> Representative Todd said that last session, and he's, He's one of the authors of, of uh, one of the anti the AIE bills. He said, the teachers are bigots. They're discriminating against white people. They're harming the sensibilities of our white children, made to feel like it's a, they, they're responsible for the sins of their grandfathers. And they're going and killing themselves as a result. They do a causal relationship between teaching race and the high, the growing rate of suicide. That's cruel. <laughs> That's not, not the right comportment. We don't do that. You don't do that. If you want to, if you want to build something, you act right, you speak right, and you speak out. So one thing um, that I'm, I'm thinking about, based on what y'all just shared, is that we have a thousand fires, right? like to put out and these are weapons of mass distraction and you have to fight them because you know we're ethically more morally bound to do that but we can't be everywhere all at once right and so that's a really important issue in terms of the um, the goal of being an agent of change right and so and so um, I mean and if you look at the landscape and maybe even in this class I mean it's like, well, I'm kind of siloed off on this bill, and I'm kind of siloed off in this bill and on this other bill, right, and maybe with certain constituents or certain communities or certain organizations, which is helpful, and maybe there's a little bit of inter interlocking and intermixing, and which is good, but it's not enough, particularly given the assault and the gravity of the assault that is on us. And so uh, it seems to me that um, one way to encapsulate it more and bigger and to be a, a better you know to be better change agents as a policy and advocacy community is it is to frame this as an attack and assault also on Gen Z because when you're talking about Gen Z now you're it's an umbrella right for all of the bad bills almost all of them that, that are happening right now I mean the the anti uh, you know, transgender, the gender conforming care bill, the, you know, the anti-abortion. I mean, you've got, now you, once you, like, understand it as an attack on a generation of young people, then all of a sudden what gets, like, you know, like, folded within that, into that, it, so DEI becomes part of a, a more an extensive kind of, um, um, you know, sort of like a larger uh, policy uh, agenda by the right to, to harm. Um, I mean, I've been pushing for this, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I think it'd be helpful to hear from uh, from you all if you don't mind uh, maybe recording our uh, leadership here on BBDP Next Gen. Uh, I know Mighty has been part of it, but uh, what are your thoughts? Well, it's a framing. It's a way to framing, and it's, it would be strategic to be, to be able to bring in young people. I'm happy to be wrong about this, okay? I really am, because I, I'm just trying to put it out there that this is, we're in the middle of, of, of an existential struggle here, right, for our very existence. And this is gonna impact your kids and your grandkids, right? And this is the most generationally, uh, uh, the most diverse cohort in our generation. And Gen Alpha is behind them. That's going to be even more diverse, okay? It's not going to go away. It, it's, it's a demographic shift. It's inexorable. It's not going to change, right? It's just going to be more, right? And it's not that demography is, is, de is destiny, but demography is inexorable in the direction that it's going. And that doesn't have to be and should not be a negative. It should be a positive. So I don't know what ideas y'all have, but I'm putting it out there. Should I just give context first and then? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I feel like Daniela has been the primary one who had been attending the meetings, and I got looped in a little bit later. 
But some of the thinking that we had when we initially decided that we needed to do more to engage students came from other conversations that we were having with faculty, staff, community organizers, and advocacy organizations. Um, because a lot of the framing coming from the right is about indoctrination. And I think that framing and that messaging really um, tried to clip our communities at their knees. Because as we talked about, a lot of the work that we do is about relationships. And it's about respecting our elders and looking to our, our elders for advice and guidance on the work that we're doing. Especially when we have people like Dr. Valenzuela, Dr. Zamora, and, and Mr. Bledsoe in the space that have years of advocacy experience that can teach us. Um, so we felt like as students, um, being the primary ones that are benefiting from DEI programs, benefiting from ethnic studies courses, it was crucial that that voice was represented in the work that we were doing. Um, because I'm someone um, from even before I applied to college have benefited from DEI programs. I had free trips to campuses, overnights. I got to see, um, I went to the University of Michigan. I got to stay on campus for four days before classes started and I met my professors and I walked through my schedule with older students. And then every job I had was in a DEI office. You know, I was in a DEI organization and I went to a DEI graduation ceremony. So quite literally everything that I did that ended up bringing me to Texas was a result of this programming and this work. Um, and I think my story is just one of many. I'm certain there are students in Texas that have similar experiences and receive scholarships, are in McNair, are in all of these different programs um, that are helping to support them. And when we're talking about this being an attack on Gen Z, it really is um, when we think about addressing kind of inequity and systemic inequities, that is exactly what DEI is. And I think Generation Z has been able to benefit from those years of advancing equity and addressing these systems. Um, and people seeing the results are not happy with them. Mm -hmm. They want, they feel like the power that they had, you know, um, is slipping away. So that's exactly what's happening. And trying to dismantle it is how, how are we going to try to claw back um, the power that we had. So those are my initial reactions. Ah, so good. I think a little bit on that point, what I'm feeling is that I grew up taking a lot of what we had in the 70s and everything that we established with DEI. I had very similar experiences as you. Um, worked for DEI programs and uh, was part of DEI orgs on campus. I went to a predominantly white institution. There were not a lot of Spanish-speaking um, students there. I was bonding with a lot of the janitorial staff because they are the ones that spoke Spanish and I could speak Spanish with them and only them. And so I think what I'm feeling and what I'm observing is that when I look at my friends, the people that I went to college with, my cousins, my siblings, I feel like there's this very big disconnect um, historically. I think we, thinking about my own education, I grew up in Central California. I did not learn about black and brown coalitions. I did not learn about a lot of the history that I did learn in undergrad after I sought out those spaces mm -hmm. Um, in ethnic studies or in MEDCHA. Um, and so I think there's a disconnect between what happened in the 70s very recently and what is happening now. And so what I saw when we were attending these meetings um, with our um, elders who have this experience and are saying, hey, this stuff is happening again. Mr. Bloodso just said, I didn't think that we would have to fight these battles again. I think what I feel is that our generation is disconnected from the reality that this is happening. And I think what I have seen is a lot of, so on social media, a lot, especially on TikTok, on Instagram, we're seeing students kind of coming to the realization that, hey, these things are under attack. They're actually trying to ban diversity, equity, and inclusion. They're actually trying to ban the Raza Resource Centro, the, uh, black, uh, Latinx fraternity sororities. There's, I think, realizations happening. And so what we wanted to do with Next Gen was help with that realization, was connect people at UT in Texas to 
what's going on at the legislature because I think that's where the disconnect lies is what, hap what has happened historically, what has worked historically, and then what's going on in the legislature. So any other questions? So it seems like you were, you took it for granted, right? We yeah. took it for, we were very, dis I think disconnected it from it. We took it for right. granted and now we're experiencing it being attacked and so now I'm scrambling to figure out, well, NAACP, what did you do? What can I do? Please teach me, please. And it's, it's difficult to not be able to just flat out say, you know, I am learning from the NAACP, or I am learning mm -hmm. from um, Dr. Valenzuela, Dr. Samora, because they know, so, but the right wants to paint that as indoctrination. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's difficult to navigate and it's, I think, misleading and I am feeling, I'm like realizing now, I feel like that narrative is serving to kind of sever the relationship right. between Gen Z and our elders. And I think it's just, I don't know, I, I'm insightful. saddened by it. Yeah. yeah, that's very insightful. I would have never have like, like thought of that had you not said that, wow, that's important. I think we're at the, at the top of the hour, right? Is it time to? I hear the. Can we have questions? Uh, yeah, maybe? I was about to say. Questions. If people can, which I don't know what time it is. We have two minutes. 45. 45. We have uh, a little bit of time. Yeah, I don't want to keep you all over. But yeah, if there's any other, any thoughts, any questions, um, reflections. I thought this was excellent what you shared. I have. So I found. I brought up this quote earlier that I couldn't find. Oh, sorry. Oh, you found it. Oh, <laughs> yes. Good. Okay. And I think a lot of the comments that people have shared are surfacing this. This is straight from the horse's mouth, by the way. This is not like, this is a, someone that ran on uh, trying to stir up racial animosity and won and was successful saying exactly what his strategy was. It's former Alabama Governor George Wallace. Um, and again, initially he ran, denounced the Ku Klux Klan and lost and then he's trying to change his strategy. And he said, I started off talking about schools and highways and prisons and taxes, and I couldn't make them listen. Then I began talking about, he says, a racial slur, and they stomped the floor. And that's his, his rise to power. And um, what I'm really sitting with right now is trying to think of, as we're organizing and trying to do what is right, what is the messaging that's gonna win for us? Um, and you mentioned like getting to the reptilian instinct, like, and going for the head or going for the gut. And I'm, I feel like they have found this is what's going to get our base to get out and vote. But I'm like, what? What do you think is going to get us across the finish line and kill these bills? Abbott and DeSantis are trying to out George Wallace each other. You know, that's what and uh, DeSantis are trying to out George Wallace each other, right? And that's pretty clear what's going on. And the, uh, I don't know if they included the quote in the book, but he had a quote that I won't repeat here, but it's pretty outrageous uh, what Wallace came up and he, he, he coined it himself. And no one's going to do this better than him in the future. And, and, he, and, uh, and he proved it, and it just really works. And that's what Carl Rove would do, go for the reptilian instinct, you know, go for what, and, and so when you, when, when Jesse Helms is about to lose on the uh, Senate race in North Carolina, and he comes up last week with, uh, with a, um, a telev television commercial with, a, with a, a white hand getting a rejection slip and throwing it away, and you see a black person taking the job and you just go and you appeal to those, those issues, and and that's what does it every single time. And and we don't we don't do that. We need to we need to paint what America looks like to them. The one example that I love to use that that we can amplify more, and there's probably so many more out there. Uh, I think it was Denton or town in that area that was having earthquakes because of the, all the fracking. Mm -hmm. And so even though it was a very conservative Republican city, uh, they passed an ordinance to address and prevent most of the fracking that was occurring. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the oil and gas lobby went to 
the leadership in, in Austin, and they got a bill passed overturning the law. So they didn't really care about those Republican families in that community. They didn't care whether they would die from an earthquake or what would happen to their property values, uh, what concerns they'd have about uh, uh, maintaining the safety and security for their families. They didn't care. They, the, the, all the companies wanted to make money, and they gave it to them. And so we need to come up with things like that to let people know, yeah, it's black and brown people today, but it's you tomorrow. That old Niemöller poem, you know, you know, first they came for the, uh, the, the, the socialists, and I didn't stand up because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. I didn't stand up because I was uh, not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't stand up because I was not Jewish. And then they came for me, and there was no one left around. See, that's the kind of idea and that we need to paint to people, because I think most people are good people. I think that the good people in the world outnumber greatly the bad people in the world. But, but, but um, Myrtle Captain, who was a re uh, retired secretary of the NAACP, was my secretary there for about 10 years. And she was brilliant. And she started out as a washerwoman at uh, Fort Hood and ended up being the highest paid uh, non all person on the base. And, and she said, you know, and, she, and this is her speech at her retirement party. She said, I've been around here for 35 years. And I thought about it, and a lot of good things happened to me, and a lot of bad things happened to me. And I thought about it some more, and, 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 and most of all the, the bad things that happened to me were perpetrated by whites. But I thought about it, and but most of the good things that happened to me were done by whites too. So that made me think even more. And she said, you know, and, and all my experience here, that in 35 years, uh, I can say there's a whole lot more good people in every group than bad people, but quote, the good ones stand by and let the bad ones do their dirty work. That's what's going on right in front of us right now. They're changing our state, making it into, uh, if, if you go read the book on how Hitler came, I know my wife tells me never to say that because it's extreme. But you look at the things that were done, whether they're talking about the textbooks, you know, the, 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 the classroom, isolating people, uh, this, this whole exalting uh, uh, race, this whole, whole issue. You, you look at the, it's like each peg uh, in, the, in, in, in the puzzle is, 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 is being filled. So we, we, need to do, we, need to, we need to do our own reptilian uh, thing. I think that's one example with Denton, but there are going to be many more out there. We need to know, let them understand here that it may be us today, but it's going to be them tomorrow. And, and you guys may have other great examples, but, and it's really true. I'm not just saying it because of politics and I want to win uh, for black and brown folk. I, I, I think I want to see a great state where everybody gets along. And, you know, uh, people always had that fear, you know, if you ever let blacks take power, it's going to be like in South Africa. They were so fearful that you guys are going to do us the way we did you. But, like in, but you can see that didn't happen, right? We don't, we don't have that malice that, that other folks do and just start killing people for, you know, because they're different. You know, we just don't have it. You, you think we do, but we don't. You know, but that's a big fear that folks have. I would say in response to that question is that you have different audiences and depending on the issue in the moment, you speak differently to different people. But one of the thoughts that I shared at the press conference had to do with the, the fact that, um, I use the word igualado in Spanish. I think you liked it, I knew that. <laughs> igualado is a very good term, speaking about language. Igualado is a term that, that we use in the Spanish-speaking world, sometimes in a nasty way, most of the time. But uh, one of the things that I would tell the Mexican public is nos ven como igualados. They think that we're, we're trying to be stand next to them as if we're equal to them. To tell someone, it is, te estás igualando. You dare to think that you can stand next to me and, and look like you're equal to me. It's a very disdainful statement, but the variation of that would be to tell the parents, say, you know, they don't think your girl or boy are good enough 
to go and attend the same university everybody else does. That's a powerful argument. The, the second, that's the first kind of embellished response. But the other is, we need to tell people to, to build their libraries, everyone. All families should build libraries. We only had the Bible and, and the encyclopedia. The encyclopedia was miraculous in our family. But uh, we need to have more materials that have been published since the 70s. You know, one of the arguments I made with, before the State Board of Education is that the curriculum the, for the state of Texas, the standard curriculum, lags far behind the state of the literature in African American studies, women's studies, Mexican American studies, and so forth and so on. I, I, most of the things that have been written about do not appear in the standard curriculum. So, so you, can, you can spend your whole lifetime trying to convince these people to include some of this material. Let's say they can. But at the same time, there's another strategy. Get people to build their libraries, to learn about all that has been said about all kinds of people. This, this is a great literature, historical, literary, and so forth. So that, that's the second response, I would say. When you speak to any audience, build your libraries. Make sure your children are well informed. Don't depend on the public schools to do it for you. You need to take responsibility as a parent. I like that story in the Phillips book that was about oh. uh, when the schools were closed down because whites didn't want to integrate. They'd rather have them closed down that the black community, they still taught the children and the churches assumed that responsibility. I'm interested in that history. I don't know that history and, and what happened in those spaces. And so it's like a variation of what you're saying. Education never ends, right? It never ends and it should never end. Um, it's not optimal to not have it paid with our hard earned tax dollars. But um, that said, we're entering a very, very difficult time period in history. and. The education cannot but there's stop. Hope and, there's and there is hope. For optimism. There is hope. It all rests on us. Any questions? Just to uh, finish out the evening, from anyone, anything that you want to ask of our guests or um, to the, of the class? Any thoughts or statements? Yes. Um. Obviously, yeah. all of you have had these incredible careers and have these great legacies. So, what are you most proud of? When it comes, when you look back on your career, what would you say is your greatest achievement or what are you most proud of, what you've accomplished? I've earned my parents' admiring love. <laughs> <laughs> That's the highest, one of the highest forms of love in my mind is when your parents admire you and express that in so many ways. And I think, I think I've, uh, I've fulfilled, I've, you know, I've made my parents proud. Cornell West is so good about that. He starts his talks by saying, you know, I'm, I'm the son of so and so and so and so. And that's where I started. That's your beginning. I always assign family histories to my students so they can discover those kinds, rediscover those things. Sometimes we, we take things for granted, so many things, including parents or, or adults that have done good in our lives, in our early years especially. But I think I've earned that admiring love. <laughs> I thought I might be—I might be your crowning achievement. <laughs> <laughs> I told her once, you're the—you're the best expression. I'm the best expression of your good taste. <laughs> A shopter. <laughs> it was all in chest, okay. <laughs> Hashtag humble. Huh? <laughs> Hashtag humble. Well, yeah, it's humble. It's a humble statement. <laughs> Gary, what's? Um, you know, there, there have been a, a few things in life that we're all very uh, proud to have been part of, and and sometimes it's hard to really uh, um, select what stands out. Um, you know, because of life, you you have some great victories and you have great losses too at the same time. And so it's not all just peaches and cream that uh, they're sometimes the vagaries. And I guess maybe I'm, I'm, I'm 
torn between two things, um, and maybe I will uh, choose the um, litigation that kind of changed, though it still has a whole lot of need for changing more, the Austin Police Department. Um, because I represented a group of 13 and 14 year old African American kids that were having a party on Valentine's Day um, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And they were brutalized by police for no just reason. And I had two police officers to break the code of blue silence, but they had 95 police cars, 95 police cars to show up at a, at a location in East Austin on Cedar Avenue. And they pulled guns on and did all kinds of things to those kids and tried to flip it with them. And um, our jury was out the first time for three days and we ended up losing, but not all the jurors flipped. And one of the jurors came to me afterwards and told me that the judge's bailiff uh, Billy Lincoln had come into the jury room on the third day and said, this is enough. Bledsoe and his clients are a bunch of you-know-whats, and y'all need to decide for the city. And he started put, bringing all that racial invective. And so um, I know the judge didn't believe it when I raised the issue with the judge later, but he brought everyone back, all the jurors. And all but three of the jurors said, yeah, Judge, he did a whole lot more than that. And so they got to tell about all the jokes and the racial invective that he had to get the jury to flip and to go. And so uh, I got a new trial. And on the eve of the new trial, uh, the city settled and put like $1.3 in a fund for my clients. And, and, and I won bigger cases, but... But that, to me, was really snatching uh, victory from the jaws of defeat uh, because it took a Latino hero who was the juror uh, uh, Ezekiel Hernandez. Um, Ezekiel came and told me that, and the judge didn't want to believe it, but Ezekiel had the courage to do that. And we got a new trial, and my clients got a lot of money. They got to go to college and all that over it. And it's interesting, I didn't get a dollar because the police association said they would oppose the settlement if I got one dime because they hated me that much. But I, I'm, I was cool. My clients got money. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, that's amazing. Amazing. Any other questions? Um, uh, one more maybe from the audience. Kim? Let me get, I'll take it, I'll take it. Um, I'm, I'm thinking back to our messaging um, because my brain thinks about action. How do we, how do we put this into action? Um, and I'm wondering if that, you know, that reptilian brain that we're, that we were kind of going back to, I wonder if you think that that can come from a place of hope or of love rather than a place of fear or a place of, um, um, you know, threat. Um, Bell Hooks kind of talks about, you know, she, they, they wrote, it's all about love. Um, and, and I think that that is may, maybe a more of a feminist and intersectional lens. Um, so, so what are your thoughts about that? I'm curious what you're... How, how can we frame it from hope or from love? Um, and also, do you think that that would be effective? I always like hope and love. <laughs> <laughs> the reptilian brain, is there a... Uh, that, that's a beautiful question. <laughs> it really is, because you naturally think that you go to the negative, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how you get people to join on, on your side. And I use it now in jury trials 
and I, I think I try to use it in a positive way, but that's a very difficult question. That's, that's a great law, you know, that's a great uh, exam question uh, for law school or something, because <laughs> how do you do this in the pod? Because what you're trying to do, this is, I've gone to many seminars on the reptile, reptilian theory, because it's really the big deal. And what the rep reptilian theory is, what you're trying to get the juror to do is to look at the evidence and what the juror does, and they assess the evidence, they assess the evidence in light of what's good for them and the people that they love. Okay, and that's what you need to understand. They're not talking about this Latino person, this black person was wrong, there's a sense of justice. That's not what motivates people. So, um, um, is there a way of looking at, you know, January 6th and looking at the uh, hate movement and what's been propagated around um, uh, in terms of the revolution that's going on that people, many people are not aware of that's going on? There may be a way, uh, because I think that by and large, um, uh, and I think President Obama was right when he said, you know, we'd be in a lot better shape if, if women were in control because we wouldn't be worried about nuclear wars and things like that because they're just a superiority that women have. And I don't know, maybe there's some kind of way to have that kind of connection where you can come up with that kind of a message um, that appeals to people who want to rise above. Because I, I actually think, now this sounds uh, simplistic, but, you know, I, I look at the world, I, I look at... Uh, whether you got people of color fighting each other uh, because of different sects of the same religion in some country, and you got people who are different tribes in one country that are fighting each other, committing genocide on one or the other. And you think, wow, what's well, happening here is bad, but it's happening everywhere. But, but it seems like this kind of pluralistic society that we've come about that, that where we have now, and, and you were back there in the 60s and 70s, people thought, well, if you get one black or brown on the city council, then the whole world's going to be destroyed. And what you found out was that things became better. You, you turned out, it turned out that people weren't the ogres that you thought they were, right? And, 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 and so you had more harmony in the community. And so, you know, it's, it's a whole idea of, like, understanding what... what, what uh, uh, you know what uh, what uh, uh, what Nesbitt, what what um, uh, 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 what's it called uh, uh, that used to be us? Uh, what's the, the 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 author New York Times that used to be us? Um, um, but anyway, so what we're, what he talks about is the reason how the society becomes stronger when you do that. And so uh, when I look at where we are and how. We, we learn to share, and you won't find that in many other countries, right? You go to the city council, you got a black, you got a brown, you have an Asian, you know, have an LGBTQ person, and people are just people and trying to do the business of the city, and that's something to be, and we need to put that up to show that that's how we go as a country, because if we go back to where Dan Patrick wants to take us, we're always going to be fighting, okay? The whites are always going to be fighting blacks, blacks are always going to be fighting the browns or whatever, you know? You go back to that kind of America, you never have peace. Now, some people don't want peace because they want profit, right? And so, but if you really want peace, and we can apply to that, maybe there's some kind of way of coming up with a message that's positive with the reptilian theory. But it is the reptilian theory that dominates uh, the, the head. And so we need to understand that first. But maybe there's a way, especially with women voters, because women... Uh, uh, vote much more than men, right? That, that if you look at the electorate, it's primarily uh, women. But but the, the interesting thing is, and what I'm surprised a lot of people, the data shows women support Republican candidates. Women support Donald Trump even after the comments and things he's made and the things he's done. And he increased his support among women in 2020 over 2016. So you tell me. Uh, but, you know, I think that's a great idea. Uh, to think about some kind of way, but we need to have a broad message that's appealing, and maybe that's a, a big discussion to have. I'm not sure I got the bandwidth to come up with it, but you young guys may come up with the with the, the right kind of ideas because I think that's a winner if you can do it 
with the positive message. I don't know that it works because it comes from uh, a Republican uh, political philosophy and it's, it's nothing but a kind of a repurposing of the Southern Manifesto and what George Wallace was doing. It's just the same kind of idea where you go and you find a couple of things and you're dishonest, but you know what motivates them. And you got one person over here talking about the economy and, and trying to explain economics to people. And you got somebody else uh, speaking fear and that fear, fear, fear trumps reason every day. And so I don't know how we do that unless we somehow can reach some pinnacle. And you think with religion and things like that, maybe there's some kind of way how do you reach the people that go to church on Sunday and support hell on Monday? I don't know. This, that this political structure that we have in place, they're not going to inspire a new generation. I mean, in this room, you're a testament to that. They're not going to do it. That's why they have to be forceful and oppressive and mean and mean-spirited because they can't inspire you, right? I think that they've reached their limit, right? I mean, where are they going to go from here? I remember reading about Arizona. Uh, about Arizona, and uh, and they actually got to a point to where they had no ma no more mean Im immigration bills to pass. I mean, they hit rock bottom uh, in terms of they did in terms of I know it's ridiculous, and and uh, and of course then we had this shift in Arizona, right? And so uh, sometimes you just have to give them an, an, a, you know long enough rope to hang themselves, and uh, I mean. I'm sure they're creating divisions with them because nothing good can come out of that hostility, that terrible energy and anger and rage and resentment. What, what good comes of that, right? More resentment than hate. That's what, That's what comes, destruction. That's what the bishop said. What comes out of this is more destruction. So we do need the faith community involved, definitely, right? We need our Gen Z students involved. And, and, I, and I think that we get more and we're more consistent when we vibrate from a good place, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, I think what's underestimated is the power of unity, unity consciousness, love, forgiveness, loving kindness, caring, all of the virtues that we all grew up with, right? That we know are, much, it's always been the answer. Love has always been we, the answer. We forget one community, by the way, uh, the community that will most directly be and immediately affected are the folks that have made a career out of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. The folks that are working in these programs and it's not just the staff in the programs, but there's other folks in the departments and stuff that are also in colleges that are involved in promoting this. They may be out of jobs, you know? What are they going to do? You don't want to disrupt people's lives like that. But I mean, that's a community that's going to be affected immediately and uh, if any one of these bills passes. So, so to me, the silver, the silver lining, if there is one, I think we might look back on this time period, I think the silver lining is going to be that they tried to do all of these terrible things and they were successful at some of it, but they ignited a movement. They ignited consciousness to what you were saying, uh, Daniela and Jules. They've ignited us. I saw a lot of young people last Wednesday. I don't know if you saw them, but a lot of student organizations. And that's where we're going to find our, our, our level five leaders. I, I, we can already see them, right? We can already see them. This kid came up to me. I was with you, tough, at the Capitol, <laughs> and I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know him from, I guess, from from Zoom. And and you remember, he came up to me, and he just grabbed me, and he hugged me, and he just, he wouldn't let go of me, right? And um, and I'm just like, you know, who is he? Who is he? <laughs> who is this young man, right? And uh, now I know him from, you know, like Zoom calls, and it, it was Audrey from the Texas Freedom Network. To me, that's, you know, that's love, right? And he was grateful. He was expressing. He didn't even say anything. You remember that? He just, like, hugged me. He wouldn't let go of me. But that was love. That was so powerful. And I loved him. And, and you know, he needed a hug in the movement. We all, we've got to be loving and caring. That's what's going to buoy us. It's going to support us as we move forward. Because we can't do it. We can't do it without that love and caring and that, that partnership and the really deep, passionate commitment to social justice, right? That's what's going to carry us. And that's what's going to carry this state forward. And it's your generation. You know, we're going to be like, you know, moving on at some point. And so it's y'all. It's up to you 
to, to take this and move us forward right now, not tomorrow, right now, and you're doing it. I'm not saying you're not doing it. Yeah, yeah. But you're doing it, and, and, you insp and I've told you that I wasn't insincere. You do inspire me, and you inspire all of us, and anything that we can do, I, I think you know, we would all agree that uh, anything that we can do to support you in your efforts to be all that you can be, to be better than us, Right? Any good teacher always wants their students to be better than them. I want you to be better than us, to be better than me, to, to, to take this and go forward and, and lead our state and lead our nation. You have it. You have, there's nothing that you don't have that, that, that you, you cannot move forward with. You have it all. I'm so excited. I really am. I'm very hopeful. Huh? I totally agree. The spirit of these young people is just so far superior. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, how many of you are graduating? Raise your hand, please. I totally agree. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. Y'all have been the most impressive class I have ever had. And I've had a lot of impressive classes. Y'all are amazing. Y'all are extraordinary. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, teach us. Teach me. Continue teaching us. Thank you so much for an amazing semester. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I still can't get her question out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs>